listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I got to tell you something, people. It was probably, I think it was 86 or 87. And uh, my roommate from college, Benny Lowe, had moved to Philadelphia. And at the time, the movie Street Life, 20 Greatest Hits by Brian Ferry and Roxy Music came out. And now he was living in Philly, and we were walking down South Street, and we went into the Tower Records. And when we got there, we saw one copy of the CD, and we both wanted it. And now Benny, he grew up in Hong Kong. He was very polite. Me, growing up in New Jersey, I wasn't that polite. So I figured I could talk him into giving me the CD and let me get it. He didn't, he didn't buy it, so I had to distract him or I pushed him, and I grabbed the CD and I got it. But he got even because as I got in my car later that day, he asked if he could borrow my Pretty in Pink soundtrack. And I let him do it, and it's 35 years later, and he still has it. Anyway, my guest, uh, he, was, he played with Roxy Music, but he said so much more going on. He has a, he has a new collaboration, he, a new EP coming out, and just he's so busy. And I'm glad he could come speak to me. My guest is Phil Manzanera. How you doing, Phil? Hello, yes, I'm doing very well, thank you. It's a nice sunny day here in West Sussex in the south of England. It, it's, sunny in, it's sunny in the Philadelphia area, and we've had bad weather lately. So I want to ask you, you know, they, today they just named the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame members. Okay, the, the, the list was announced, and now Roxy Music was inducted, I mean, just two years ago, and... What yep. is that? What yep. is that like? Were you guys waiting for it? Did you expect it? What does what goes through your mind? And how did they tell you that you've been inducted? Uh, well, we weren't expecting it at all, you know. Uh, and um, it was a big surprise. Yeah, somebody somewhere sent, I think Brian Ferry, an email, and then he texted us. Um, all of us uh, separately and uh, you know we said wow that's, that's just amazing i mean we haven't really had a lot of uh, awards or things like that over the years so we were really very appreciative and especially coming from america which you know is always uh, you know we weren't sure how popular or you know so we had no idea we'd get into the rock and roll hall of fame so it was fantastic. Now, what was the awards ceremony like? Because you guys got to play, and, and you're in front of great musicians. Duran Duran introduced you. Got your, your the Roxy Music. What is that like? Is it is it is it a special concert? Because I, I talk to performers where every concert is special, but is there something like a little more when you're sitting there and you're in front of people who have said you're in the realm of rock and roll hall worthiness. It's a very nice atmosphere of like togetherness, really, about musicians. And it just uh, reinforces what I always hoped for, that musicians can be very generous to each other. And, and the guys who were there, the whole of Fleetwood Mac, Neil Finn, who I've known since he was a teenager, you know, Brian May was there. Joe Elliott, obviously, all, all the, the, the Def Leppard. I mean, the zombie, it was it was just like an out-of-body experience, actually. It was, I stood up. When we, when you go out to your table, you know, I stood up and I looked around and, it, and I thought, wow, this is America. You know, it's huge. It's <laughs> enormous. And I just soaked it all in. And I thought, gee, this is great fun. No, so I, I loved it. We, we rehearsed in Brooklyn for about four or five days because we hadn't played together for about five years. So we were a bit rusty. So, um, <laughs> you know, as a band. And uh, it was, we, we just wanted to do a good job. You know, we wanted to acquit ourselves well. So we tried really hard, you know, because we knew it was important. You know, because you never know when it's the last time you're ever going to play together or something. So, you, you know, you want to make it count. So, uh yeah, yeah, I was you're too busy trying to just concentrate and, and play well and smile and wave, you know, and uh, <laughs> showbiz. You know. But it was an awesome event, you know, see Stevie Nicks up there and, and oh, just all those great players. And, uh, yeah, no, really good. So now you mentioned uh, 
Neil Finn. Well, you just you're you've been collaborating with his his brother, and it's funny because I know you guys recorded a bunch of songs, and I guess during pandemic and you're miles and miles and miles. It was like thousands of miles apart. How how did you meet Tim, and how did this collaboration start for you two? Well, funny enough, I mean, I I originally met Tim in 1975 in uh, in Sydney, Australia. It was on the first Roxy Music tour of Australia, and uh, we got there. And I turned on the television in my room after a very long flight, and and who should be on the television but the band that Tim had, which was called Split Ends. And uh, it wasn't what I was expecting to see on television. You know, I, I just thought, they were, wow, this bunch of complete freaks. And how did this happen? How did we never hear about this? And then by complete coincidence, they were the support band for us at the next day at the gig. And so I, I looked at, I, I watched them on the side of the stage. And then I said, um, you know, if there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. And then I walked off and then a little head popped out and said, will you produce our album? <laughs> <laughs> and so we have a long history, you know, and, and, and when Neil was was uh, brought into Split Ends, where, uh, when he was just 16 or 17, you know, he hadn't been playing electric guitar uh, he'd be really been playing acoustic guitars and doing some gigs, but they brought him to me to sort of give him some tips, you know, about how to, you know, play electric on stage and stuff, you know. So that was very sweet. So I've known them, wow, like forty-five years, and I've bumped into them. I, I once was in LA when they were mixing Woodface, you know, and uh, and uh, I went along to see them. And then they had a little appearance in a club of uh, some tracks from the, for MTV. <clears throat> and they said, why don't you just come on? And so I jumped on stage with them. And without me knowing, they broke into a Roxy track, Love is the Drug, <laughs> to my complete surprise. <laughs> they were a, just a bunch, of, you know, they're just a bunch of fun guys and so talented, those Finn brothers. So, um, yeah, so we go back a long way. But actually, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I yeah, met T uh, Neil again. And, and he invited us back to uh, uh, their party they were having at Stevie Nicks' hotel. And um, I sent Tim a picture and said, look who I found in New York. And then he, he uh, you know, we began talking and I found an old rehearsal tape and and I sent it to him, and then he, uh, and a year ago, he just sent me an email saying, have you got any Latin kind of grooves that I could write some stuff to? And it started from there, and then every week, we went through a very creative period, and suddenly, you know, there's 20 songs. So have been working on that for the last year, and the first fruits of that were announced last week, and uh, it's coming, coming out in on June the 18th, just a four track EP to start with, because there was just too many tracks, you know. So uh, there'll be another EP in August and whatever. So you said there's too many tracks. I believe you guys recorded 20. How do, how do you choose? Because it's like anything. I always think of musicians when they collaborate, like you're going to have the ones you really like, and they're going to have the ones they really like. And there's going to be some that you both just love. But do you, do you sit there and go, you know, no, you had one, I want one. How did you pick the four out of all those 20? Well, um, just a series of emails. I mean, what we discovered <clears throat> was that w we had a Zoom call about a week ago, and, and we discovered that we actually hadn't seen each other since uh, 2011. And we didn't, we didn't even think of having a Zoom call over this last year. So... <laughs> We only communicated through emails. And because of the time difference, I send him something, uh, you know, during the day and it'd be nighttime there. When I woke up the next morning, he would have put something on it and come back with it. And I would then send it back. So it's like backwards and forwards. And, and the same with the process of deciding what should be on the first EP. And today we were just hearing about what should be on the second. You know, so 
uh, I say something and I put a question mark after it to be, you know, not say, yeah, this is it. And then he will say, oh, blah, 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 with a question mark. And then gradually we negotiate via email. <laughs> Now, now, what's what's your experience? Because you know you've you've been in the business for a long time. You've produced. You've been in studio. Do you now personally like not like being in your home studio and doing it the way people have been doing it during the pandemic, or do you miss being in the studio with everybody and you know having to get it done when everyone's there? What do you like better? Um. I think I actually prefer um, messing around with it myself first. Till, especially with new material, you you're crafting all the time, so you're learning what the song is and what the musical context is. It's very difficult to achieve that when you just go in and play all at once. You know, I mean, the way one uh, used to do analog recording. You know, the, the pretty much conventional way was that you went in uh, the band and you play a backing track and then you overdub bits on top of it. So what you were really doing, nearly 90% of all the records that were made, I mean, like, look at the Beatles and stuff, the whole picture took loads and loads and loads of, of uh overdubs and trial and error stuff before it ended up with the final uh, what people hear on vinyl. So, I mean, that's a quite a different thing to the sort of when you have an orchestra, say Frank Sinatra recording a, a song that's already written, a well-known song with a, a ranger, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about 50s, early 60s. Once they invented multi-track recording, it, it evolved into a whole different process. So, what I'm doing now, really, here in this room with a, a, a logic, you know, um, software, uh, is really a continuation of, of that. You're trying to find what the song, what world the song lives in, and, and what the groove is. Yeah, the luxury of, of actually then. Well, what that means is really, in the old days, people used to do demos and then go into the studio and try and, uh, you know, get the feel of the groove or stuff like that, which in general works brilliantly if you've got fantastic musicians. But if you haven't, or there's a weak link, <coughs> you're in there for fucking months, you know, <laughs> and so tearing your hair out and wishing, you know, you could get a session player in or something. <laughs> which has caused a lot of trouble with many bands over the years. So it swings and roundabouts. I mean, we have to adapt as musicians. We adapt to whatever uh, is possible. And, uh, you know, I think in this last year, everyone has been under the cosh, as they say. And But, you know, music is what we do. So we will find a way to do it. And uh, it, you know, be interesting to see if the music that comes out this year if it has a particular flavor or feel to it, that's that's different. I mean, it's a big subject. I don't know. Well, the music. Now, I was reading up on you. You started playing guitar at a very young age. Age, I mean, it's a very young age. How how did you decide to pick up a guitar? I know you moved around a lot when you were younger, but what made you pick up the guitar for the first time? Well, when I was um, six going on seven my parents moved to cuba in 1957 before the cuban revolution <clears throat> two years and my mother who was colombian uh, started having guitar lessons to sing with her italian friend songs <clears throat> and when you're six or seven you just want to touch everything and, and you know my mother said oh god's sake Stop touching my guitar. Okay, I'm going to have to teach you a few things so that it's not a disaster, this thing. So she started teaching me something which is called acompañamiento, which is just chords, but like plucked chords, to Cuban and, and Latin, you know, Spanish chestnut sort of songs and things like that. So I started with that Cuban guitar. 
which I still have. In fact, I picked it up from my recording studio in London yesterday to bring back. Made in Havana in 1955. A beautiful little Spanish guitar. Still sounds amazing. And uh, so I started learning stuff like that. <clears throat> then after the revolution, we had to leave and uh, went to Hawaii. You know, and then I could see people with ukuleles and things like that. So that was cool. And then Venezuela, where they had a four-string instrument um, as well, um, a cuatro, four, four strings. <laughs> and um, But then I met, there was a British boy who was in England. He used to come out for the holidays. He was a, at a boarding school, and he had a... Um, a uh, what they call a, a famous semi-acoustic guitar with a pickup on it. And he showed me some Chuck Berry riffs, and that was it. You know, it was like, I listened to the radio to England World Service and begged my parents to send me to England to boarding school when I was nine. So, because the music was just like, it got me, you know. It's funny because, you know, it, it's how everyone gets affected by something because the music you would play when you were younger, that's very difficult music. When you listen to any music with a Latin flair, it's very, very guitar, very, you know, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, you know, you sit there, even yeah. when you see the yeah. mariachis playing, you know, they're, they're playing, yeah. they're, they're good players. They're good players, yeah. So, so did that help you as you were learning rock and roll and learning the electric guitar? Did it help you because you had that, the, the ukulele? the El Corracho and other things, did it help you grow as a musician? Because you had, even at a young age, those influences in your system. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No, I, I sent uh, a letter to a company in England of like, how to play the guitar, you know, sort of, where do you put your fingers? You know, I, I, had, I hadn't, didn't have a clue. It's so different. The grooves were so different. Everything was different. So I got back a, uh, what they call a, a Xerox type of piece of paper with musical theory. And that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted that's like pictures of where do you put your three <laughs> to play a chord. And so I used to look at, pit, you know, once the Beatles started and all that, I was a fan club member. And I used to look at, study the pictures of George Harrison and John Lennon just see where were they putting their fingers could I see could I learn somehow that way but it wasn't until I got to school in uh, in England in London and then through friends at school there was always somebody some smart ass who could play it the thing properly and he they would say so how do you play that you know and then they'd show you and they always said to me you're playing it wrong <laughs> So I built my whole style out of playing it wrong. <laughs> it served me well. <laughs> exactly. So, so you're in England. When when do you start getting in bands? I mean, because everyone always says they've had so many bands before they get that band. You know, you hear stories of like, you know, we were 13, we were playing at Jing, and we were 16, we were playing in bars that we couldn't be in. When did you start joining bands? Were you a teen? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, at school. You know, you can imagine in the 60s, well, everywhere in the world, well, you know, America and in the UK, everyone, once the Beatles happened and the Stones, everybody wanted to be in a band, have a band. And um, nobody wanted to be a solo <laughs> artist, you know, it's a band. <laughs> and uh, with your mates, with your friends and have a good laugh. And so, yeah, school, we had a band and, we, and very soon, uh, you know, uh, psychedelia happened, uh, you know, the middle 60s and freeform stuff started happening. And we started listening to the early albums of the Grateful Dead and Spirit and uh, the Velvet Underground and, and uh, some, you know, early British bands, early Pink Floyd, early Soft Machine. And we wanted to be like them, you know. And, and um, so we and then we decided, you know what, we we need to do our own stuff. And of course, uh, we played about six gigs just at local church halls and things like that. Nothing particularly serious. But we, but when I was, um, so when I was about uh, 15, 16, my father died 
in South America. So my mother came back to the UK for good. And, and by that stage, I was obsessed by music and pop music and rock. <clears throat> and Jimi Hendrix had appeared and, and it was just like incredible. So I said to my mother, who's a sweet lady from Barranquilla in Colombia, didn't quite really speak English very well. But I said, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll stay on at school, take my exams. But really, I just want to be in a band, in band. And she said, band? What the band? What's a band? <laughs> I said, mira, mama, quiero estar en el conjunto. No, 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 no. So my brother said, look, I'll, let's go and have, uh, let's go and talk to a guy I know who's just become a professional musician. My brother was up at Cambridge. And up in, in Cambridge, he'd met this guy. <clears throat> so we went to see, uh, just turned 17. We went to see this guy, and his name was David Gilmore. And he had just joined <laughs> Pink Floyd. And after our lunch, he went to Abbey Road Studios to continue recording on The Source of Full of Secrets, which was the first album that Sid was on as well. <clears throat> So, you know, um, I had met somebody who was, as far as I'm concerned, famous. I thought, hang on. Okay, if you can meet somebody who's done it, it you know, you can see someone that you think, well, maybe I could do that too. <clears throat> you know, so, and I also met a guy called Robert Wyatt who, from The Soft Machine. Uh, <clears throat> and so there were two people who were in the, coolest bands in London, Soft Machine and Pink Floyd, you couldn't get cooler, the underground. And so it was something to aspire to. So that really uh, kick-started, you know, us playing at school and everything. Then I left school and I answered an ad. <clears throat> After a year, I had we had a band, like a prog rock band that didn't get anywhere, really, called Quiet Sun, which we subsequently record an album that seemed pretty successful. Um, but um, I saw this advert in, in the Melody Maker, which was a music magazine, saying, uh, guitarist wanted for Roxy. So they were just starting Roxy. <clears throat> so I went along, I was 20, I just went along for the audition. <clears throat> You know, met Brian Eno, met Brian Ferry, met Andy McKay, and uh, got on really well with them. And uh, but basically, I failed the audition. <laughs> they 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 sort of decided they wanted someone with the name, and they had a guy called Dave O'List, who was a fantastic guitarist in a band called The Nice, with Keith Emerson, and they'd already toured America and with Hendrix, and all, and he was incredible. So I thought, well, that's a shame because I, I think these guys are really cool. And then it didn't work out with him. And two months later, I got a phone call saying, will you come and mix the sound? And I said, I don't know anything about mixing sound. And they said, don't worry, Eno will teach you because he's doing it in the audience at the moment because we banned him from being on stage because it makes everybody too nervous. So... <laughs> So uh, I said, OK, well, I went along and they said, oh, uh, Dave hasn't turned up his guitar. I said, do you want to have a go? So I had a go. And then the next morning they said, do you want to join? And then a week later, we signed the first contract. Uh, four weeks later, we were in the studio recording the first album. And eight weeks later, it was number four in the charts. What and is that like? Years later, I mean, 50 you know, years later, here we are. You know, I mean, it's just amazing that, you know, I mean, I'm sure they had the record deal going before that possibly because you know you hear you hear it's just i mean how did the record deal come about that quickly were you guys that good did you have a different sound i mean what happened well i tell you what happened was that there's a very famous dj in england called john peel now if john peel said you were good you were good and there was a great a journalist called richard williams who wrote for the melody Mix. he said you were good you were good we had both of them so yeah, it's true. The um, No record company wanted it, but the management company said, we will sign it, we will finance the recording, which was only like $6,000 or something, and, uh, and then we'll try and sell it to a record label. So once we finished it, they sold it 
to Ireland records. And, you know, and then it was a hit. So then once you have a hit, they want you. you know? <laughs> now, what is it like, you know, as you, you have a hit, so you start playing more and you have a popular album. What's going through your head? Because you're, you're, you're very young and it was, you think about it, it was sort of a whirlwind for you. You auditioned. Yeah, yeah. Then boom, Absolutely. you have an album. Like you're in the studio and you're like, oh my God, I'm with, you know. You know. And why was everyone afraid of Eno? <laughs> they weren't afraid of Eno. <laughs> they weren't afraid of Eno. I mean, Eno is a very unique person. He's absolutely brilliant. But he, he was like from another planet. You know, he's so cool and uh, still is very cool. And, and he's very cerebral. And, um, you know, but he likes to dress up as well. So, you know, at the time... <laughs> He went over the top with all the makeup and stuff like that. And, and he created himself a persona, which was incredible. You know, that's why Bowie loved us, really, because we all had like these whack, crazy personas that we all dressed up and stuff. But Eno, you know, was also art school background. You know, and Brian Ferry was art school background. Andy Mackay did music at university. I was the only, me and Paul were the only sort of primitive players. You know, we were there to, to provide the sort of rough side of everything, <laughs> to rough it up a bit, you know. And, uh, no, it was great having, have being with, you know, and we got on very well. And it meant that, um, um, we, it meant that we, you know, did a lot of, uh, experimenting together. And so, and we lived in the same apartment and, uh, you know, it subsequently led to when he left, I continued working with him for another five five years till he went to work with Bowie and then I virtually never saw him again. Now, in the early days, what kind of gigs were you playing? Did you did you guys have to, because you had, you had a popular song, did you pass, did you not have to play in the bar gigs and the club? I mean, what was your touring, what was your live performances like in at a young age? Because I've heard, you know, some of the bar gigs in England could be a little bit uh, terrifying. But no, I mean, uh, we played all the very small pubs and, and clubs. Yeah, we, we, you know, it was a little circle. You had to do the circuits. But we did it all very much in quickly. You know, the first, uh, the first year, if you like, we just, that was incredible. When I look at the diary of how many gigs we did, that first year it was extraordinary we, we, and we um you know we prepared for a, a, an album which we did at the end of that year but we just just played and played because we considered ourselves to be sort of amateur inspired amateurs and we um wanted to be more professional so we just had to do more and more gigs you know in the up and down the motorways in the back of transit vans and just like everyone else did then, you know, and, uh, you know, same sometimes supporting Genesis at a little pub and sometimes not supporting Bowie at a small pub in Croydon. Um, you know, that was fantastic with, uh, I don't know how, you know, I, I used to say to, uh, if when, when we got together, me and, David later, you know, we said, if he said, if Phil, if I had a pound for every person who said he was at the Greyhound in Croydon, which is the name of the pub, I'd be a millionaire. I said, well, you probably are a millionaire, but I, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, everyone says they were there. There were probably about 40 people there, you know. <laughs> you know, what's amazing is, you know, from 72, 73, 74, 75, you guys put out a lot of albums. And when you were still touring, how do you handle that workload? Because now you see people will put albums out every four years. But, I mean, you guys are pounding out the music. Was it, was that because you just, Brian was thinking of new ideas? Or was that because a record company is saying, you guys are hot, we, we want you to play? I mean, how did you, why, first of all, why did you have such an amazing, I mean, that's a very prolific time, I mean, in, Five years, yeah. six albums. Well, um, yeah, I mean, 
I guess we were driven by <laughs> by the management probably and by the record companies. You know, they said right. You know, the minute you'd finished something, they'd say right, let's book the next tour. Oh, you need to have an album done for that. So we would find ourselves sometimes not having finished the album going on tour to promote the new album which we hadn't finished and driving back every night to london to the studio to finish the album it's the sort of thing you can only do when you're young in your 20s uh but that and obviously we we were keen we wanted to do more and more music and every you know because it was being successful and all over the world you know you felt responsibility to do new stuff but also to do something different <clears throat> every time so that was that was hard you know to make sure you weren't repeating yourself and uh, you know in all areas you know Brian with his subject matter for his lyrics us with the musical context that we put his singing into you know but you know there was a lot of you know musicians there with with depth you know of different kinds of mu- interests and music even though we had certain things in common you know uh, from jazz to classical to to folk to rock to blues to soul you know between us we had a lot we created a large musical palette to draw on and you know not complicated stuff because you know we, we weren't you know, I've been in a prog rock band. I didn't want to play in 17-8 or 11-8. I wanted to just play in 4-4 <laughs> and, and deal with uh, textures, musical textures, and a, a different kind of sound to maybe w- what maybe some other bands were about, you know. Now, when did you first come over to America to play, and what was that like for you? I mean, now you've traveled a lot you know from your childhood so but a lot of people they're leaving for the first time and they come to america and they go i mean you lived in america in hawaii i mean so yeah. you're probably like yeah this is i've been all over you know i've been here here what was it like when you guys came to america and how was their reception to you yeah well oh, like most bands you come to new york first and it was um even though i'd been to new york as a child briefly uh it was you know, coming to New York at the end of 1972 was a real uh, mind job. I mean, it was like scary and big and, and like amazing. And, um, you know, we uh, we were with uh, Premier Talent, uh, an agency uh, run by Frank Barcelona. So we were put on a support. And, and within two days, we were supporting Jethro Tull at Madison Square Gardens. And it was like being in a sort of nightmare, really. We had these tiny little amps that we'd been playing in pubs and small venues. Suddenly we found ourselves in a huge place, <laughs> had no idea about sound or anything. And, you know, and our crew were very inexperienced. And so we went on and we did our thing, but it had no impact at all because I don't think anyone really heard us. <laughs> and then we watched Jethro Tull, and they were amazing. They knew how to do stagecraft, and they had the lights. And, um, you know, I went back to the dressing room afterwards and spoke to Mick Ralph. Uh, said, wow, you guys. Wow. And that's because they had learned how to play in America. And, and uh, we sort of realized that we had a long way to go if we were going to make any impact in America. And so the whole, you know, I mean, we supported Marlowe in uh, Fresno. We had bombs, thrown, um, water bombs thrown at us, you know, like it was like, what the, who are these weirdos, you know, like, um, but we just kept playing regardless of, whew, whew, you know, all the water being thrown and stuff, get off uh, and insults and stuff. But, you know, we were determined I mean, the first time in L.A. we supported 10 years after, you know, the difference in the music was incredible. But we could see how and then Humble Pie for lots of times, all sorts of bands that really weren't appropriate for us. But we it was a great learning 
experience, you know. When, America was just like incredible. Yeah. When did you feel that, uh, at what point in your career did you feel that Roxy Music was starting to get appreciated by America? I think by about uh, 1975, 76, before we stopped for a few years, um, that tour was great. We had Love is the Drug, a uh, single out. I think they made a little tiny little bit of a uh, impression on the charts and stuff. So we thought, okay, this, this might be. And then, uh, then you know, we stopped working together for a few years. And then uh, when we got back together, we went to New- back to New York to do some recording. And under the guidance of Armit Ertigan and stuff, and um, and we started our sort of second phase, which led up to Avalon, and then we slowly built up uh, more of a following in uh, in the U.S. Now Avalon, I always said I posted this on Facebook a while ago. It's it's to me one of the sexiest albums. I got I get funny because I got married a year. Well, it'll be two years in September, and. I, we were on the weddings. We play, I think the DJ played more than this twice because I, I take it. And, and it's funny because we played Avalon because in New Jersey, there's a very popular shore town called Avalon. So I'd always oh, think yeah. of that. But explain how how did you guys make an album sexy? That's so weird because, you know, it's just one of those you listen to. And it was a, it was a rainy day a, uh, a few Sundays ago. And I just laid on my couch and I put that on and it, it transfixes you. It just... It, it makes you relax and it's just got that air. I mean, and so many people think that. I don't know if you know that, but people think that's like just a sexy album. Like if you're on a date in college, especially in the 80s, you know, you, you wanted to put that on when a girl came back to your dorm. Did you guys aim for that? I mean, when, tell me about just the formulation of, of Avalon. Well, Avalon came about because we changed our method of working. You know, we had evolved from 1972 to when we recorded Avalon in 1980, from a band who went into the studio, played backing tracks, and then built stuff on top of it, to Avalon, where by that stage, I had a recording studio and uh, in, in the grounds of my house, and it became the Roxy, uh, it became the Roxy sort of base, really, for at the end of Flesh and Blood, and then for the whole of Avalon. And really, it was... The control room was designed, was huge. It was like based on a Westlake Audio cutting room. It was so big, so you could play in it. And so we would then play in the control room and then uh, work on stuff using the desk and equipment that was available as, as instruments, really. So this was a totally different way of working that meant that the overall sound was very different because we, you know, if you change your method of working, you would come up with a different sound, whether people like it or not, is another matter. But so the process made it very different. So, you know, you combine that with, you know, eight or nine years of experience of recording, of producing, of uh, knowing how to use equipment in the studio, <clears throat> And then you have Ingredient X. Now, Ingredient X is you go to New York to Bob Clear Mountain, the engineer, stroke producer, genius now, and then he takes what you did in your personal studio and he turns it into complete magic by mixing every track in three hours, two tracks a day, five days done and, and and that is it you know so <laughs> you know I mean you know Bob Clark, Clear Mountains record you know record I mean when I went to the, the mix of Woodface it was Bob Clear Mountain in LA mixing it for a crowded house you know it, it, Springsteen you just have to you just you know the guy's a genius. <clears throat> so, you know, combine, that was the culmination, if you like, of years of experience and then having a couple of recording engineer, Rhett Davis, and mixing engineer, Bob Clear Mountain. 
after Avalon, when did you guys decide to take a break? Well, we we came on an American tour, and it was our most successful tour. Uh, I think it was eighty one or eighty two, and and then I think Brian really Roxy finds it very difficult to be together for more than five years at a time. After five years, you need a complete break. You know, because like most bands, you just you get fed up with each other, and real life impinges, and you have families, and you have other priorities. So, like every other band, we decided. Well, actually, Brian decided that he wanted to go off and pursue his solo career. So, you know, I I, uh, I just had some kids and stuff. I wanted to be at home, and. Uh, and so we didn't actually, even though I I did play on a few of his records over the years, we didn't actually play a game together for 20 years. And then we were back together for five years and then we'd had enough of each other again. And then we briefly got back together. And, um, you know, and time's running out. <laughs> now, I know you worked with, uh, explain to me uh, Roxy Anthony. I don't know if I pronounce it right. Yeah, Rock Symphony. Yeah. Tell me about that because it seems a lot of people are, everyone's liking to play with, you know, these symphonies because it just it gives us a different edge to music. Tell me how this came about. Well, the, uh, Rock Symphony was two years ago and it was really Andy Mackay's project. And he had done an album uh, uh, with an orchestra based on psalms, religious psalms. And um, he wanted to do a concert at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall in London. And he realized he only had enough material for half a concert. So he said to me, look, I've got the orchestra. I paid for why don't, in the first half, why don't we do, reimagine some Roxy tracks as um, with this orchestra? So we thought, yeah, sure, why not? I was up for something. So. We did that, had some very limited time for rehearsals, uh, but we had two people who had played with Roxy, uh, violinist Lucy Wilkins and um, a pianist, Colin Good, who knew Roxy stuff backwards. So they did the arrangements. Bandy did some arrangements too, but they did the arrangements. And so we came on and played it. And the first time I'd actually heard any of it properly was when we actually played it on stage. And uh, we decided to record it. So, you know, I was there playing it and I was thinking, wow, this sounds really good. I'm re really enjoying this. And then it was over <laughs> and it finished and people were crying. And even I, you know, when we played Tara from um, from Avalon, an instrumental with the orchestra, you know, it was a moment. And I thought, wow, OK, this is really good. Perhaps we should do this again. And then course it's not easy to play with an orchestra it's very very expensive and, and then covid happened so you know who knows it might happen again we had plans to go and play it all over and go on a tour and stuff like that but that you know that got shelved so it got on with something else well you mentioned quiet sun earlier yeah now you and you said you recorded later how did that how did that happen how did you end up being in a band then years later you recorded Okay, so after five years of being in Roxy, um, everyone was doing solo albums. Brian Ferry, Andy Mackay, I've been helping Eno. And I thought, wow, if, if they can get... Let, let me just ask the record company. Please, can I make a solo album? They said, sure, yeah. So I, it was an excuse to um, just get friends along, like Robert Wyatt and John Wetton and people like that, and Eno to sing on it and play on it and then I thought you know what we had this band before Roxy called Quiet Sun it was sort of prog rock uh, they said it had absolutely no commercial potential at all why don't we secretly record it at the same time as the solo album not letting not letting the studio manager know that we were doing that because he was the guy who turned it all down at Island Records originally he said why don't we do it secretly, and then at the end, go into his office and say, guess what? You know, so we did. So we we recorded it, uh, and Eno helped out, and 
um, we recorded it, and then it came out at the same time, really, as my first solo album, Diamond Head, and it got great reviews. So we then went into the guy's office with the reviews and his rejection letter <laughs> and said, and actually, this is Steve Winwood's brother, Muff, Muff Winwood, and we had a good laugh about it. He said, Muff, here's a letter with your signature on it saying, this band has absolutely no commercial potential at all. Forget it. And here's a review from Melody Maker saying it's absolutely fabulous. What do you think of that? Anyway, I mean, Muff was the guy who uh, he did the first Dow Straits album. He was the producer on that. You know, so it, it's all sort of connected in a funny way. But but that a lot of that music became the basis of uh, a, little, a band I had with Eno called the 801. And we made an album called 801 Live, which had Simon Phillips on drums and uh, Eno and me and Bill McCormick from Quiet Sun. And we did one concert, recorded a live album, and it's been very popular for the last 45 years. Now, when you were with Roxy Music, you wrote some of the songs on the albums, and now you're writing more. Was it, with Roxy Music, did you not write as much because... Brian wanted to write everything, or how did that work? And then, well, to answer that, and then I'm going to ask you how you've developed as a songwriter over the years. Yeah, well, to start with, you know, when I'm first in the band, I'm the new boy, and they had all, uh, it was mainly Brian's chords and things like that, and everybody fleshed it out with their sounds and things like that. Once Eno left, and we realized that we needed to, to evolve, musically uh, from the first two albums and the way to do that was to integrate some of my stuff and Andy Mackay's stuff so we gradually started offering one or two songs on each album <clears throat> but re really we we're trying to only do 10 songs on an album at that point you know we're, you're talking because the limitations of vinyl and stuff you're talking about 40 minutes for, a, for both sides so you couldn't fit that many songs on. So, um, yeah, so we offered songs. And then if Brian felt he could write something to it, then he did. But, yeah, he had a lot to say. He's a very good lyricist. So, you know, it was yeah, that worked well. <clears throat> I mean, over the years, I, you know, I can count on, on my, my two hands the number of people that I've written, co-written stuff with. Brian Ferry, Brian Eno, uh, David Gilmore, um, Tim Finn. Hang on, I'm, I'm not even getting to one. No, John Wetton, obviously. Uh, but not lots. But, but it tends to be singers. And I always think that singers should sing their own words. I mean, I did four al solo albums of my own with me writing the words and me singing it. But if I co-write with someone, hopefully it's a singer and I want them to, I'll do the music and I want them to feel the words when they sing it. You know, I think it's important. So when you write with someone else, you pretty much, you write the music first and then they listen to it and it stirs a certain emotion and then they write it. Yeah. Now, what, that's hap it. what happens if they write something that you don't like and you go, no, that's, that's not what goes with this music I wrote? Well, yeah, it, it's always uh, tricky. But, you know, I, I, am, I have a producer's hat on as well. Remember, I've produced a lot of people. So uh, <clears throat> if it's obviously, you know, you can't win all the stuff. So, you know, you do a whole load of tracks and, you know, it's a percentage game. Some are going to be better than others, and you do your best. And it, and if you know, you keep quiet about the ones you don't like so much. Maybe they're on the album, but you don't really talk about it. And because they, you know they're not really that good, they never get heard anyway. So, but you just keep, you keep doing what you have to do to get, to get music out there, you know. And you keep trying. Why do you think you're such a sought-after producer? Is it just something that your track record, it's because you know music? I mean, what makes someone 
a producer that people want to work with. Because it's like anything. You know, I lived in L.A. for a long time. There's tons of actors, but no one wants to work with them. But there's, you know, like there's, everyone says I'm a producer. But what makes you, because you've worked with so many great, great people, is it they just trust you? I mean, what, what do you personally think is the reason why they go, I want Phil to produce this? Uh, well, it, it's a bit like being a chef, really. <laughs> you know how to put the ingredients together, and then you sort of put it around and you taste the soup. And say, mm, that's good. Oh no, it needs a bit more salt and a bit more pepper. You know. <clears throat> uh, but I always don't want to do any more producing. <laughs> I, I, I really had it with producing. <laughs> um, just in case anyone's thinking of asking me, please don't. You know. <laughs> um, no, I. I um, I'm there. I'm from the George Martin School of Production. I don't touch the desk. I know what a desk does, and I could frig around with it. I don't do that. I'm not an engineer producer. I, I, I'm, I, I'm more like a conceptual guy. I'm thinking about what are we doing here? Why are we doing this song? What's this song about? What's the atmosphere? What's the musical context of this song? So uh, that is what I know what sounds good. I will offer an alternative. If, if so, I'll let the, the whole point is it's it's whoever I'm producing. It's their album. It's not mine. I'm there to help them, and um, you know to make sure we don't go down a rabbit hole in the nicest possible way. Think of ways to, in the nicest possible way, to say. We're going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just be, a, you know, an extra here and help out. You know, that's it. You know, I, I do have a large musical palette to draw on. You know, I was, I listen, I always say to people who want to be musicians or producers, listen to a wide range of music, everything from Sati to freeform jazz, you know, and I love music. I just, I get excited by music. And if someone's doing a good job in the studio, I get excited. It's fun. You know, I, I don't like being there for hours and hours and hours, though. That's not my, I'm not a sadist. Now, now, you said you love music. Is that why you got involved in Solidarity Express? Exactly. You know, one of the reasons I got involved in music right from the beginning was I guess I was a bit of an only child being dragged around the world and so you know I want to be in a band to meet people have mention of that is that you know I like having musical conversations with all different musicians if they'll have me from different countries so I met a lot of musicians and they say well let's have a play together and regardless of the style of music whether it's Cuban musicians in Havana musicians in South Africa from lots of African countries, whatever, I I basically play the same thing. But the context changes, you know. I listen to what they're doing. It's a bit like jazz. I listen to what they're playing. I try and respond and I try and understand what their groove is. What they, And it's fascinating. And I think, you know, from the beginning of the 90s on, onwards, world music, if you like, opened up to many, many people more people and the appreciation of music from other countries just skyrocketed and you know there's a lot of great music from lots of countries all over the world and uh, you know I particularly because of speaking Spanish fluently and stuff have worked a lot with South American musicians and Spanish musicians and Latin musicians sort of See, doing rock in Espanol, really, but not so much ethnic type of stuff. But um, I could appreciate how wonderful they are singing words about their experiences in their own language. And to me, it didn't bother me whether it was in Spanish, French, Portuguese, or some African language that that I don't understand at all. I just, I got the groove, I got the vibe and it was joyous, you know. So that's why I love Solidarity Express. You know, I, we went and toured in Italy two years ago 
and I think the drummer was from the Congo. There was a, a young sax player from Soweto who was about had about nineteen twenty. There were Joe, Joe Berg, amazing musicians. <clears throat> And you stand on stage and you play along with them and you think, wow, these are, people are so talented. You know, they, they don't, it doesn't necessarily lock into what chart music is, but it's real stuff that helps them in their lives and us with the music they make. You know, because I really believe music is a kind of therapy for us all and we need it. It enriches our lives. So, for me, it's just I'm just on a journey, you know, uh, playing with diff these different people, and uh, you know, through <clears throat> this lockdown, you know, I haven't been able to travel like many many people. But this album that uh, that uh, these tracks have done with Tim, you know, that they're, they're it's got like people from twelve different countries <laughs> on it, and about. 10 different nationalities ranging from teenagers to 70 year olds you know it, it really does encapsulate almost everything that i'm about as a musician you know one final question yeah what is your if you had to pick one what is your personal favorite roxy music song Ooh, that is very difficult uh i think if I had to pick one, I, I love Remake Remodel. The first track on the first album is totally chaotic. It's very short. <laughs> it, uh, you know, when I played along with that, the little bubble coming out of my head was, I'm in the Velvet Underground. <laughs> <laughs> I love the chaos of this song. Everyone's going like crazy and uh, it's short. And actually, conceptually, it's a great lyric. You know, it's it's a it's an art world based remake remodel. You know, um, I mean, Brian was taught by this British pop art artist thing. I think he has a painting called Remake Remodel. I'm not quite sure, but um, yes, yeah, so I, I I love the energy of that. It's great to play live. Well, I want to thank you, Phil. This has been great. People, uh, you got to go check out his website, Manzanera. That's M A N Z A. N E R A dot com. You get all his info on there, and you can find him on Twitter from there. He tweets a lot. That's how I found him. I tweeted at him, and I was very excited when he said, "I'll do your show." So check him out. Go go listen to the. It comes out, I believe, the 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 Tim Finn that comes out in June, right? Yeah, and we we have a little uh, website there as well called finmans dot com. F I double N M A N Z dot com. So it's people, all there, the info. So people check it out. Uh, also go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 850 uh, episodes up there. Email me, cooper, at coopertalk.net. Twitter, I'm at coopertalk. Instagram, at coopertalk1. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.